This week we're going to talk about the isolated Christian and perfection. Now many of you probably heard about this, and I certainly did when it came out. This is back in uh, June 25th of 2014. Pope Francis uh, made this little speech here. I'm going to read from the National Catholic Reporter. And uh, he says here, Church is essential for faith. There are no free agents, Pope says. He said here, Christians are not made in a laboratory, but in a community called the Church, Pope Francis said. At his weekly general audience Wednesday, Pope Francis continued his series of audience talks about the Church, telling an estimated 33,000 people that there is no such thing as a do-it-yourself Christian or free agents when it comes to faith. Every Christian, he said, can trace his or her faith back to parents, grandparents, teachers, or friends. I always remember the nun who taught me catechism. I know she's in heaven because she was a holy woman, he said. Uh, kind of interesting there, you know, I know she's in heaven because she was a holy woman. Um, I know people that are saved and in heaven right now because they put their faith in Jesus Christ, not because they were holy in and of themselves. Pope has kind of a weird idea of what salvation is. But uh, continuing here, it says, In the Old Testament, the Pope said, God called Abraham and began to form a people that would become a blessing for the world with great patience, and God has a lot of it. He prepared the people of the ancient covenant, and in Jesus Christ constituted them as a sign and instrument of the union of humanity with God and unity with one another, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> Pope Francis described as dangerous the temptation to believe that one can have a personal, direct, immediate relationship with Jesus Christ without communion with and the, and the mediation of the church. Interesting, because that's how a lot of the uh, independent fundamental Baptists think. Obviously, he said, it is not always easy to walk the path of faith with other people. Something is, it's, sometimes it's tiring. It can happen that a brother or sister creates problems for us or scandalizes us, but the Lord entrusted his message of salvation to human beings, to us, to witnesses, he said. It is through our brothers and sisters, with their gifts and their limits, the Pope said, that he comes to us and makes himself known. This is what belonging to the church means. Remember, being Christian means belonging to the church. If your first name is Christian, your last name is member of the church. <laughs> and of course, he means church as in the Catholic whore, Mystery Babylon of Revelation chapter 17 and 18. You know, he doesn't mean the body of Christ. At the end of his talk, the Pope asked people to join him in praying that they would never give in to the temptation of thinking you can do without others, without the church, that you can save yourself of thinking you can be a laboratory Christian. Christians, he said, are not manufactured in isolation, but belong to a long line of believers who handed on the faith and challenged one another to live it fully. The audience was the last the Pope was scheduled to hold before beginning a reduced Summer schedule. Blah, blah, blah. Okay. Now, the reason I read that article there is because a lot within the uh, Protestant, you know, the supposed Christian movement are coming out with the same thing. And you will run into that same exact philosophy if you talk to people that go to Babel buildings. You can't do this thing on your own. If you leave a Babel building, if you're not part of a good local church, even though the term doesn't appear in the King James Bible, look it up. If you're not part of a good local church, you're isolated. You're a hermit. You're, you're, something's wrong with you. Well, I'm here to tell you that while it is true that you should have fellowship once in a while with the brethren, while it is true that you should be out there witnessing and talking to people and things, you can't be a hermit in the sense of living cut off from society and never going out anywhere, which, you know, people try to put on me because I bought land, you know, in, in the mountainous area. Well, I bought land in the mountainous area because that's all I can afford, first of all. But secondly, uh, we do go out in town quite a bit, and I do witness frequently. So, you know, there's so many lies about me out there. It doesn't even, it's not even, what even makes sense to try and answer them all. You know, I just, they'll come out with new ones, and then they out new ones. Try to sidetrack me from my work, which, not going to happen. But, um, anyhow, you know, the fact of the matter is, as a Christian, yes, there is a responsibility there to other people to other members of the body of Christ. But I'm here to tell you today, if you don't manifest that personal relationship with Jesus Christ, if you are not working on that, if that's not something that's very real for you, and it can only happen in isolation, by the way, not permanent isolation, 
But there are times when you just you just need to get away from other people, other Christians. Especially as we get more and more into the time of the great falling away here. As it gets worse and worse and worse. There's a lot of people that they don't have an option. They can't go anywhere. They've tried. They've been to places and things like that. You know. But I'm going to show you, even if you have a good Babel building, which, if that's possible, even if you have a really, really good one, you still need to have some time in isolation. It will help develop your character as a Christian. We're going to look about that in this week's study. Now we're going to look at five reasons why a Christian must be in isolation occasionally. Like I said, this sermon is not saying that you have to cut yourself off from all other Christians and you can never talk to anybody else, no fellowship. That's not what this is about. But what this is about is the opposite end of the spectrum is the Bible building people say you can never be in isolation. I'm not trying to say that you can never be in fellowship. See? I'm not trying to say that. They are putting things onto us. But what I'm saying is if you're in fellowship all the time with other believers, there are times that you need to get away from that and be in isolation. And I'm going to show you that in the Bible today. Now, five points I said. Uh, first of all, salvation is individual and not corporate. Okay? Now you say, well, the corporate, you know, corporate means the body of Christ and stuff. Okay, I mean, when you're born again, you're part of the body of Christ. I understand that. But it has to be between you and God. Salvation does not come upon you automatically because you go to some Bible building someplace and there are other people that are saved there, so it automatically comes to you. No. Or because your family is saved, therefore you are saved. No. You have to get things right between you and God. That's salvation. That's how it starts. Turn to John chapter 3. John chapter 3. We're going to look at this here today. John chapter 3, verses 1 through 7. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest, except God be with him. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus saith unto him, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is sp spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. You say, why did you point there at the screen when you said thee? Very important distinction in your King James Bible here, your archaic King James Bible. Gets it right here. You see, whenever you see thee, thou, thine, thy, it is always a reference to a single person. It cannot be a reference to more than one. All right? When you see ye, it can be one and others as well. So look what Jesus said there in verse 7. Marvel not that I said unto thee, who's the thee? Nicodemus. Ye must be born again. So Jesus is saying, Nicodemus, I'm speaking directly to you, pronounced correctly in proper English, thee, that not only you, but everybody else needs to be born again. But what is salvation in that passage? It's individual. It's something that Nicodemus had to get straightened out between him and God. He had to become born again. And ironically there... How did Nicodemus come to Jesus to talk to him? Verse 2, So the same came to Jesus by night. Hmm. Interesting. He's sneaking around through the back streets. He doesn't want people to see him. Seems like he's ashamed to go to see Jesus Christ. You know that's the reason a lot of people don't get saved? Because they're ashamed to come to Jesus Christ as sinners. They're ashamed to give up their self-righteousness. They say, well, I'm a good person. God would never send me to hell. I'm not that bad. Hmm. Interesting. Turn next to Acts chapter 17. This is not going to be an exhaustive study, by the way. 
This sermon today is more of an exhortation. This is not a so much a Bible study. I'm trying to exhort some of you out there because I know, I know how it is. You know, you're isolated. You're you're not going anywhere. You know, and people put you down. Oh, you're in a cult. You're you're not in a church. You're not in a local church, so you're not legitimate. And bleh. you know, yeah, whatever. We're gonna see about that. Acts chapter 17, verse 30 and 31 says, And the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent, because he hath appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men, and that he hath raised him from the dead. Someday I'm going to do a sermon on Calvinism. It's just there's a lot of other projects in it. You know, it's going to take a lot of study to do this thing. I like, you know, a Calvinistic a study on Calvinism is going to be a big thing because there's a lot of scriptures to have to go through and stuff. So it's going to take me a while. A lot of stuff going on, so it's it's difficult to sit down and do like a study. It's going to take me multiple days of research to do. But just read your Bible, okay? Calvinism teaches that Jesus Christ did not die for everybody. All right, he only died for a predestinated elect, people that were chosen. Before the foundation of the world, they mess up those verses, and they say that there's only this chosen few that Jesus died for, and the rest, if you're not elect, there's nothing that you can do to get saved. That is Calvinism. And they can say it's oversimplification or whatever. No, it's what Calvinism is. That's why I reject Calvinism, because there's scripture after scripture after scripture. Right here, two of them, commandeth all men everywhere to repent. Why would God command non-elect men to repent if they can't repent. It doesn't make any sense. And down there it says, hath given assurance unto all men and that he hath raised him from the dead. Why? If Calvinism is true and there is a predestinated elect, unconditional election there, you know, the the U and the TULIP acronym, if that's true, then why would God give assurance to all men? Why would God command all men everywhere to repent? If, he, if he's only chosen a, a select little few people that are going to get saved and the rest can't get saved. Calvinism is a stupid theory. Okay, I mean, again, it just amazes me that it's lasted for so long. Just wanted to throw that in there. And, and like I said, I'm going to try to eventually put something together on that. But the point is there, again, you see salvation is an individual thing. Right? All men everywhere are commanded to repent. All men. Next, let's go to Acts chapter 16. Somebody would say, might even be the same page there for you, but uh, somebody will say, okay, but what about the whole family being saved there, then thy house? In Acts chapter 16, verse 31. Let's look about this. And they said, verse 31, and they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved, and thy house. Now, there are actually people that teach that salvation came to the jailer and also his house because the jailer believed. So the jailer got saved and his whole house did automatically as well. And I know that there are people that say that because the dad or the mom are saved, then the rest of the family is saved as well. And they'll quote Acts chapter 16, verse 31 as their proof text. But let's look at what the other verses say. Verse 32, And they spake unto him the word of the Lord and to all that were in his house. Well, if they're automatically saved, why would they preach the word to the other people in the house there? Verse 33, And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their stripes and was baptized, he and all his, straightway. And when he had brought them into his house, he set meat before them and rejoiced, believing in God with his whole, or with all his house. Okay? Did they have a free will? Yes. What what did, what did it mean then by saying, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved, and thy house? What it meant was, there were a lot of Gentiles back then that had never heard about salvation. Salvation is of the Jews. you know. So a lot of these Gentiles, they didn't know about salvation. They, never, they didn't really understand what happened with Jesus Christ and what was the purpose there and everything. And so Paul is saying, you accept the Lord here, you get saved, and... That salvation that you have now is going to come and be available to the rest of your house. We're going to have to go there and preach to them, but they're going to have that opportunity to get saved. And that does happen, you know, frequently. You'll have a member of the family get saved and, and 
they come home, they tell their family all about it, and the rest of the family gets saved. Sometimes, not always. Okay, next go to Revelation chapter 20. Revelation chapter 20, verses 11 through 15. It says here, And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. That's interesting. I always find that interesting. I mean, this is the final judgment for the lost dead. And this at this judgment, you know, you get people and they say, well, I think I've been a pretty good person. I think I'm pretty good and whatever else. It's funny because they actually believe that they're going to be judged by their works. And they're right. They're absolutely right. But it's going to be at the judgment, the great white throne judgment. They cannot get saved, you know, by their good works. And so the Lord is going to look down, and when he's judging them by their works, it doesn't mean he's going to say, well, actually, you were pretty good. You can go on in. No, no, no. It doesn't mean that. He's going to show them clearly your works didn't get you in. Let's look at what works you've done. Let's look at the good deeds that you've done in your life. And you've done all these good things, done it. just lived almost a perfect life, but you sin one time and you reject Jesus Christ. You know, because you, if you sin, you're, then you're guilty knowingly sinning and stuff like that. Obviously, he's not going to judge a child, a little baby, before they can understand that they're sinners. But I'm saying you get somebody who has reached that age of accountability, whatever that is, whenever they can understand I'm sinning before God here, and they reject Jesus Christ, they're going to go to hell. And the Lord's going to show them, he's going to judge them according to their works and say, you did a lot of things right, but you never received Jesus Christ. Sorry, can't help you. Verse 13, And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. So, that's the future of those people that think that they're going to be good enough to get to heaven. Very interesting. But notice there again, it's not the Lord saying, I'm going to judge, you know, Lot number A, lot number B, lot number C, all at once. You, know, you people all rejected me, so go in the lake of fire. No. Every individual person gets their judgment. Gets their time before God Almighty, before they're cast in the lake of fire. So, salvation is individual and not corporate. Reason number two, that you should be in isolation. Most great men in Scripture spent time by themselves. Very true. Go to Exodus chapter 24. Exodus, way back to the Old Testament. Exodus chapter 24. I'm going to be reading about Mo uh, yeah, Moses here. Let's say Noah, but no, Moses. All right, Mo Exodus chapter 24, verse 18. It says here, And Moses went into the midst of the cloud and got him up into the mount. And Moses was in the mount forty days and forty nights. Hmm. Interesting number. All right, next go to Exodus chapter 20. Back to Exodus chapter 20. Okay. Now, if you read it over in verse or chapter 19, you will see how that uh, Moses is caught up to the top of the mountain, and there's all this fire and everything else, and God's just speaking to him and everything. And uh, so he gives them. Moses comes down with the Ten Commandments and gives them to the children of Israel, and he's saying, "Hey, you know, let's talk to God here. God's right here. We can talk to God." They're actually seeing God on top of the mountain. Let's look at this. Exodus 20 verse 18. And all the people saw the thunderings and the lightnings and the noise of the trumpet and the mountain smoking. And when the people saw it, they removed. Like that. And stood afar off. And they said unto Moses, Speak thou with us, and we will hear. But let not God speak with us, lest we die. And Moses said unto the people, Fear not, for God has come to prove you, 
and that his fear may be before your faces, that ye sin not. That's what the Lord's trying to do when he wants to talk to you about things. He's, he, you're supposed to fear God. Yeah, it's fear God, but he's doing it for your good. He's trying to judge your sins and get things purged out of your life. Verse 21, And the people stood afar off, and Moses drew near unto the thick darkness where God was. Hmm. That's going to tie in later as we continue in this study. Remember that. These people said, Moses, you talk to God for us. We don't want that personal relationship with God. We don't want that personal accountability with God. He scares us. Hmm. Exodus chapter 34. Exodus 34, verse 27. Okay, it says here, And the Lord said unto Moses, Write thou these words, for after the tenor of these words I have made a covenant with thee and with Israel. And he was there with the Lord forty days and forty nights. He did neither eat bread nor drink water. And he wrote upon the tables the words of the covenant, the Ten Commandments. Hmm. And it came to pass when Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the two tables of testimony in Moses' hands, and when he came down from the mount, that Moses wist not that the skin of his face shone while he talked with him. And when Aaron and all the children of Israel saw Moses, behold, the skin of his face shone, and they were afraid to come nigh him. And Moses called unto them, and Aaron and all the rulers of the congregation returned unto him, and Moses talked with them. And afterward all the children of Israel came nigh, and he gave them in commandment all that the Lord had spoken with him in Mount Sinai. Until Moses had done speaking with him, he put a veil on his face. But when Moses went in before the Lord to speak with him, he took the veil off until he came out. And he came out and spake unto the children of Israel that which he was commanded. And the children of Israel saw the face of Moses, that the skin of Moses' face shone. And Moses put the veil upon his face again until he went in to speak with him. Hmm. Very interesting. You know, and there's a, a really good tie-in to us today as Christians. There are places, or there are times when you can really get in fellowship with the Lord, and your face might not shine and like it did with Moses there, but I'll tell you what, you'll be filled with joy, and people will see that. Why? You're spending time with the Lord. I mean, think about that. Verse 28, He did neither eat bread nor drink water. And he's writing things down. Did you ever have such a good Bible study that you forsake eating and drinking? You only are getting up to go to the bathroom, and that's only because you have to. I've been there a couple times. And I'll tell you what, it isn't going to be, you know, I've been doing this for five minutes now. Wow, you know, okay, boy, the blessings are flowing, you know. No, we're talking about many hours here. You know, and at first it's like, oh man, you know, I'm getting tired and whatever else and blah, blah, and after a while, it's just like the Spirit of the Lord starts to just come upon you, and you just start to feel that presence of the Lord, and just, you know, you come away going, wow, look at this, look, look what I found, look what the Lord showed me, look at it, you know, I was looking in the Bible, and look at this thing here, look at that there, and wow, wow, you know, it's a wonderful thing. But uh, it can only happen in isolation. Moses was going up there to meet with the Lord by himself. Hmm. Let's go to 1 Kings chapter 19. First Kings chapter 19. First Kings 19 verses 4 through 8. It says here, But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness, and came and sat down under a juniper tree. And he requested for himself that he might die, and said, It is enough. Now, O Lord, take away my life, for I am not better than my father's. Who's he talking about? Elijah. Right after he kills all these priests of Baal and everything, and Jezebel says, I'm coming after you, I'm going to get you, and I'm going to kill you like you did to my priests over there. And he runs off into the wilderness takes off, runs away from this woman, this wicked woman. 
you know, and back then I guess if you're moving along pretty briskly, you know, going a day's journey into the wilderness, you'd probably get pretty far away. Let's look at verse 5. And as he lay and slept under a juniper tree, behold, then an angel touched him and said unto him, Arise and eat. And he looked, and behold, there was a cake bacon on the coals, and a cruise of water at his head, and he did eat and drink and laid him down again. And the angel of the Lord came again the second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, because the journey is too great for thee. And he arose and did eat and drink and went in the strength of that meat forty days and forty nights unto Horeb, the mount of God. Hmm. Interesting. I think that's very interesting. So we see Elijah. First you had Moses fasting so that the ten, you know, while he's getting the Ten Commandments revealed to him from God for 40 days and 40 nights. Just him and God. Next you have Elijah here. And he's there. He runs off into the wilderness and everything and he just passes out basically. And he's just almost a nervous wreck. And the Lord comes down and says, here, eat this, drink that. And in the strength of that food there, he goes for 40 days and 40 nights. Hmm. Very interesting. Was anybody else in the desert for 40 days? If you know your Bible, I'm, you should, I'm sure you know where I'm going. Matthew chapter 4. Matthew chapter 4. Matthew 4, verses 1 through 4. It says here, Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And when he had fasted forty days and forty nights, he was afterward and hungered. And when the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Hmm. Interesting there. And I'll tell you right now, there's those times when you get away you know, from the world and you get just alone with the Lord, in isolation with the Lord, you know, and you feed on this book, you feed on this word, you study this book, and you'll come away with that thing and face will be shining. You'll just be so excited to just be like, wow, what an, what an amazing time and just have that joy. But it can only happen in isolation. That's not going to happen with you getting that corporately with a whole bunch of other members of the body of Christ. Now, you have great fellowship sometimes with other members of the body of Christ. I, I'm not going to deny that. That is true. Sometimes you'll be exhorted by a brother or a sister. That's a wonderful thing. Sometimes you're there to speak a word of exhortation to a brother or sister. Again, praise the Lord. But if you're doing all of that and never having that time alone with the Lord, you got some problems there. Galatians chapter 1. Of course, I cover these verses quite a bit. might sound somewhat redundant to go back to it, but we're going to hit it again because it just comes up in the study. Galatians chapter 1, verse 15 through 24 says, But when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb, and called me by his grace, to reveal his Son in me, that I might preach him among the heathen, immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood. Neither went I up to Jerusalem to them which were apostles before me, but I went into Arabia, and returned again unto Damascus. Then after three years I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter, and abode with him fifteen days. But other, other of the apostles saw I none, save James the Lord's brother." Now the things which I write unto you, behold, before God I lie not. Afterwards I came into the regions of Syria and Cilicia, and was unknown by the face unto the churches of Judea which were in Christ. But they had heard only that he which persecuted us in times past now preacheth the faith which once he destroyed, and they glorified God in me. Hmm. Doesn't sound like Paul had much fellowship with the brethren, right? On, as far as a consistent weekly basis. There were times he did. He's writing about it right there. Times that he went and met with other Christians and things. But a lot of times, he wasn't meeting with anybody. 
And don't give me this stuff of, well, you know, that's because Paul was a especially called apostle and we're not called into the same thing and blah, blah. Well, I don't say that you have to follow Paul's life exactly to the letter, but it ought to resemble it somewhat. Especially as things get worse, the apostasy falls, you know, it gets worse and worse and worse. The falling away happens more and more. There should be some separation. Revelation chapter 1, verse 9. Look at another example. Revelation chapter 1, verse 9. It says here, I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was in the isle that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. Now the story goes there that they had this island and basically was used like a prison and they just go dump people off on the island and just survive whatever. And, uh, you know, kind of interesting because I heard the one time that Australia was actually that for British colonies. You know, they'd take their soul or their prisoners and just drop them off there on the continent of Australia. But the point is, um, why didn't the Lord reveal the book of Revelation to a whole bunch of Christians that were meeting together so they could verify one another's story? Why did he wait till John was all by himself out on an island, abandoned out there? And he gives him the Revelation, the book of Revelation? Hmm. Interesting. Very interesting. And you know, you say, well, uh, this is just, you know, weird, kooky Christian beliefs. You know, this, this small sect of Christianity that's these lone wolf Christians that can't get along with anybody else and, and just church jumpers and what else do we get called, you know, all these other names and things. You know, you're just, you're just uh, set in your ways and you're stubborn. You, you won't, uh, you know, talk with other brethren and blah, 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 all this other stuff. You know, we'll get that put on us. But I'm going to read a couple secular quotes for you that talk about very much what I'm saying. And I don't, I'm not recommending these. I'm not recommending philosophers, okay? So don't say, beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy. I know the scriptures, okay? I'm just showing you that even among the lost, there are people that have the same mentality, this thing of isolation. Henry David Thoreau said, quote, I have never found a companion that was so companionable as solitude. We are, for the most part, more lonely when we go abroad among men than when we stay in our chambers. A man thinking or working is always alone. Let him be where he will. Now, there are some people that can think fairly good when they're out among a bunch of people. I personally can't. I need peace and quiet to be able to put a sermon together. You know, I get really, really, really irritable and downright nasty and cranky when I'm putting sermons together if people are trying to talk to me. It doesn't work. I need to have quiet and solitude. Let me alone. <laughs> me and the Lord, we need to just sit there and we need to go through the scriptures. There have been times I've gone into a sermon with a preconceived notion and it comes out totally different by the end of the sermon. Why? Well, I pray about my sermons before I get started on them, before I start writing the notes. I pray about it and just say, Lord, you, is this what you want me to say? Is that what you want me to say? And I just let the Lord put the scriptures into my head and I put them down on paper. You know? But how could I do that if I had a whole bunch of other people there talking to me? You see, it requires isolation for me to be able to have that fellowship with the Lord. Now, does that mean I live in isolation all the time? Of course not. No. But I have to have it as part of my life. Isolation is not a bad thing like the Pope tried to make it sound. Well, you can't be in isolation. You're not a laboratory Christian. You're not of this. You're not of that. You better be. Because if you don't have times of isolation, if you don't get away from other people, you're never going to mount to anything as a Christian. Mark my words. Next we have Martin Buber. He says, quote, Solitude is the place of purification. Like I said, I don't agree with everything that these guys are saying, but, you know, interesting quote. How about one from Aldous Huxley? He says here, quote, The more powerful and original a mind, the more it will incline towards the religion of solitude. Lost man, you know. Hmm. And how about this one? Quote, 
The, mon the monotony and solitude of a quiet life stimulates the creative mind. You say, what kind of a loser, what kind of a, you know, uneducated idiot would say a thing like that? Well, that would be Albert Einstein. Albert Einstein said that? Oh, yeah, yeah. The monotony and solitude of a quiet life stimulates the creative mind. And there again, when I used to work as an artist, I'd be out there in my art studio and things, and I'd be, you know, making things out of wood and creating and designing and things like that. I didn't want other people in there. It requires isolation. You have to have that. And um, before we continue, I just want to illustrate my point here. And this is just an illustration, okay? Don't get excited. Keep that in mind. I just want to talk about uh, what's going on in my marriage right now. You see, my wife, this is an illustration, keep it in mind. My wife is living someplace else. And... Um, she really doesn't talk to me very much. Once in a while, she'll call me on the phone, and and uh, anytime I get to see her, it's always when she's with her friends, and usually they're talking, and I try to say something to her, and she usually just okay, I'll, I'll be with you in a minute, and things like that. And uh, of course, we don't even live at the same place anymore, and and uh, we really aren't much speaking much together, and and we really just kind of she does her thing, and I just kind of do my thing. So. Because I have such a successful marriage, I'm going to do a sermon on marriage here, coming up, marriage counseling. You say, well, Brian, uh, that doesn't sound like you have a very successful marriage. Well, I do. I just made the story up there, okay? None of that stuff is true. But I said it to illustrate a point. As Christians, we are supposed to be the bride of Christ. Now, how would it be if a bride didn't talk to her husband? And if that bride didn't want to be alone with her husband? Wouldn't that seem kind of weird? Wouldn't it seem like, hey, something's desperately wrong here? I mean, here you have this woman, she's married to this man, and yet she doesn't want to be alone with him. All she ever wants to do is be with her friends and talk and talk and talk and talk and talk when she's in the presence of her husband. You say, what are you trying to illustrate? The average Christian... A lot of these Christians that go to the Babel buildings, the Babel buildings are social clubs. You go there, I mean people. I mean, you know, people say, oh, you were scarred in your past. That's why you're saying such nasty things against the Babel buildings. Whatever happened to me in my past doesn't change anything for me. Okay? I mean, I, I was raised riding dirt bikes. You know? And I've wrecked dirt bikes. I've been hurt bad from wrecking dirt bikes. I mean, I've... I've you know, one time I was riding and I wrecked and I came down and I smashed my face into the ground and with, with my motorcycle helmet on, it twisted my helmet, it smashed my glasses on this side, it bent them in and scraped them real bad because I had plastic lenses, and I got dirt in my mouth. That's how badly I wrecked, you know. Popped my shoulder out of joint a couple times, and so I gave up motorcycles forever and I never started riding again. No. You see, what happens to me in my past doesn't mean anything for today. I don't say, well, I had bad experiences, so I'm not going to... That's what makes things bad for me or something. Not at all. Not at all. What happened to me in the past with Babel buildings, does not, that doesn't dictate and say, Babel buildings are bad because of my experience. No, no, no. Babel buildings are bad because of everybody's experience. I've talked to other people. I know what goes on in Babel buildings. I've been to a whole bunch of different ones, and I know people from all over the world, and I hear the same exact stories. I get people in Australia that tell me things are going on in the battle buildings. Same thing going on over in Germany. Same thing going on in the UK, up in Canada. Every state in America going on. Same things. It's the same thing. You go in. It's a social club. It's all just fun, fun, happy, happy, happy. And you're just there all the time. You're going. You got it. Every time the doors are open and everything else, it's like... What about your personal relationship with Jesus Christ? Oh, it's at the church, the church, the church, the church. We don't, when I go to church, that's when I have my relationship with Jesus Christ. No, it isn't. That's when you stand around and talk about sports, the weather, politics, whatever else. Covetousness. That's what you do. I have been in very, very few Bible buildings where the people stand around and talk about the Bible. I mean, really, really talk about the Bible and are active in ministry. I've been to very few that are like that. 
And ironically, the ones that are like that that I've been to, God usually breaks up the group. So they're going out and getting things done and not just coming together to socialize. I've seen that too. But uh, if you want a good relationship with your heavenly bridegroom, you know, you better spend some time. Learn to spend some time alone with him. Just you and him. You say, um, but then wouldn't it be kind of like what was going on back there in Exodus? Where Moses is going and he's spending time with God and the people are going, you, you just deal with him, you know, we don't want to deal with him. You see, if you're going to deal with God, God might be tempted to come over to your house and say, what kind of books do you have there? Hey, um, what are those DVDs over there? Can I look at those? Can I tell you which ones that you should get rid of? How about your CD collection? Or MP3 files or whatever on your computer? How about that? You see, that's why a lot of people don't want God in that personal space of theirs. See, you can go to your church and you can play Christian. And then you come back to your house and, well, <laughs> this isn't a church. You know, this I wouldn't do this in church, but I can do it here in my living room. Uh-huh. Sure you can. See, you divorce your life with Jesus Christ and you say, I can do that. My, my life, my relationship with Jesus is over there. But I just don't know if I want him coming into my home and telling me what I can and cannot do and can and cannot watch and can and cannot listen to. You see? And I'll tell you right now, one of the best things that you can do is just say, you know what? I'm done with battle buildings. I'm walking away. And I'm just going to spend time reading my Bible. Just me and the Lord. Say, okay, Lord, let's go through this. You know, I'm just going to tell you a little story about my wife. Back before, after she got saved, before we got married, she dedicated herself to listening to the King James Bible. Audio, online. She listened to the whole King James Bible, Genesis to Revelation. First time she'd ever even been through the Bible. And just sitting there listening to it and listening to it and listening to it. And a lot of times she was just having water. For hours and hours and hours, sometimes all day. Fasting praying, listening to a couple books of the Bible just back to back, following along in her Bible, just sitting there reading and reading and reading and reading. And the Lord did some really amazing things through my wife. If you heard her testimony, she had some really amazing experiences. She hasn't even talked about all of them, you know. She wants to just give the Lord glory and just, okay, whatever. But I've seen some amazing things happen through my wife, and why? Because she has a strong personal relationship with Jesus Christ. That's very important. You say, well, Brian, shouldn't you be the one who controls that relationship and tell her what she can and cannot do? Well, to a certain extent, I'm supposed to be the spiritual head over my wife. But uh, she's going to have that relationship with Jesus Christ herself. I can't step in there and tell her things that are contrary to the Word of God. She needs to know what the Bible says. And she needs to have that relationship between her and the Lord. And, you know, she went to the Babel building thing as well. I, I don't remember if she has that in her testimony or not. But, you know, she went to Baptist Babel buildings. And it was like the whole, you know, come on, be part of the club and everything else. And and uh, we don't really have so much time to study the Bible right now. But, you know, let's just let's get you in here. And we're going to have a Christmas cantata coming up here and all this other stuff. And she was just like, nope. I was raised in the whole organized religion thing. Don't need any more of that. I just want to have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. I've done it. There were times I got sick and tired of the Babel buildings I was going to, and I'm just like, you know what? I'm just going to stay at home. I'm just going to listen to sermons. I'm just going to study the Bible on my own. Just say, okay, Lord, I want to know you. I want to know what your word says. Please teach me. And people, you know, in the, in the Babel building movement, if you saw my study on David Cloud, you know, it's like, oh, you by yourself? Oh, well, that's not a proper church. Oh, you know. You mean I can't have a personal relationship with the Lord? The Holy Spirit can't come in and teach me things? It's rather strange. Rather, uh, sounds like the Pope. When you have these 
Baptist pastors and other pastors too. I'm not I always pick on the Baptists, you know, because, you know, they're one of the ones that use the King James Bible. Most others have abandoned the King James Bible years and years ago. But, you know, one of the few that still uses the King James Bible somewhat, you know, that's why I pick on the Baptists a lot of times. And, the, you know, the Baptists are some of the most proud, arrogant people that you'd ever want to meet too. Very, very prideful people. Again, been there, done that, so I used to be one. I was very proud, very, very arrogant. But, reason number three, that you should be isolated. Number three, you can choose the group you are supposedly accountable to. There's another good one. Second Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12. You know, that's one of the big things that you're going to get put on you. Again, I've been in this thing for a long time, so I know the attacks that come, you know, and you need to be accountable. You can't, you know, you have to worship face to face. You can't be doing this thing of, you know, no Christian can grow to perfection in isolation. You can't, you know, you need community, all this other stuff. You have to have people around and all that. Let me show you there's danger in that. Second Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12 says... For we dare not make ourselves of the number, or compare ourselves with some that commend themselves, but they, measuring themselves by themselves, and comparing themselves among themselves, are not wise. You know that's what happens in battle buildings? You know that's what happens where Christians get together anywhere? You start to compare yourself with other Christians? And again... I'm not saying that there should never be fellowship, that there should, you should never, if as soon as you see a Christian, you run the other way. I'm not saying that. I am telling you, there are times and places when you need to be there to exhort, to reprove, rebuke you know, the brethren. There are times when you need to be there for other brothers and sisters in Christ. Don't get me wrong. But there is a serious, serious danger in getting into a group that won't judge your sins. Let me ask you a question. For those of you out there that are into the Babel building thing. If the average person went to a Babel building where the truth was being preached, but everybody ignored them, would they continue to go to the Babel building? No. Most people wouldn't. You know why? Because the people weren't friendly enough. See, the truth is irrelevant. The truth doesn't matter. It's, are the people friendly that's a friendly church. And you'll see all these Baptist churches, you know, the church with a heart. We're the friendly church. We're, we love you and your family. All this stuff. And what happens is you go in there and you get some guy that stands up and starts to condemn sin, starts to slam to watching television and starts to slam whatever else and you get people offended. Are they really interested in truth or are they interested in comparing themselves among themselves? You know they are. You see, the nature of our flesh, and brethren, let me just say this, with all grace and, and charity and everything, it can happen in house churches too. You can get around that right group of people that doesn't shake you up at all. That doesn't, you know, keep you isolated, you know, it's just your friends and people and stuff like that. It doesn't challenge you. It's good sometimes just to get alone. To become isolated. Why? So you can grow to perfection. We'll see about that too as we continue. First Corinthians chapter 5. Of course, if you know the Bible, you'll know this story. What was happening there in the church of Corinth. Talk about uh, people comparing themselves among themselves. How about this one? First Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1. It is reported commonly that there is fornication among you, and such fornication as is not so much as named among the Gentiles, that one should have his father's wife with gross immorality. And what were they doing about it? Verse 2, And ye are puffed up, and have not rather mourned, that he that hath done this deed might be taken away from you, among you. For I verily, as absent in body, but present in spirit, have judged already, as though I were present, condemn, concerning him that hath so done this deed. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when ye are gathered together, and my spirit with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, to deliver such an one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Your glorying is not good. 
Know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump? Purge out therefore the old leaven, that ye may be a new lump, as ye are unleavened. For even Christ our Passover is sacrificed, sacrificed for us. Question. How much leaven is in the average Babel building? Well, the Bible says right there, a little leaven leavens the whole lump. Is there a little leaven in there? You know, it's kind of funny. Another thing I've heard many times is they, you know, people in Babel buildings, they'll make fun of house churches and they say, well, you don't even have 30 people in there. You know, we hit, I remember the one time uh, the house church I used to be part of, uh, Brother Jesse Dulesky, he used to go to a Babel building, Baptist Babel building, Baptist Babel building out in Utah. And the one time he called the pastor there and he, and he was talking to him and, and uh, he said, you know, about we're in a house church here and, and the pastor was like, well, you know, I don't agree with that. That's not a le legitimate New Testament church, you know. And uh, he said, how many people do you have going there? And Jesse said, well, right now we have seven people. And he was like, oh, that's ridiculous. Seven people, you call that a church? Ho, 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 ho. And Jesse said to him, well, let me ask you a question. If you were to boil down the people that are truly faithful there in your uh, church, if you were tr to truly boil that down, the people that are coming there and taking care of things and getting the work done and witnessing, he said, how many people would you have? And he said, the pastor got kind of quiet. And he said, probably about six or seven people. <laughs> you know? Yeah. What's going on? There's a lot of leaven in that place. There's a lot of leaven in a lot of those battle buildings. All of them. Actually, if you want to get right down to it, there's leaven in all of them, every single one of them. There's a lot of socialism that goes on there, you know, a lot of talking, you know, a lot of people comparing themselves among themselves. And by the way, why would you compare yourself with other people if you are working on that relationship, that relationship in isolation between you and the Lord? See, you realize when you are in that isolated place, when you are living a life of solitude as far as you are biblically separate from other people, you realize that you're accountable only, only to God. And I had a, a guy say to me the one time, who are you accountable to? You know, they're on the internet and stuff like that. You're on the internet, you're not accountable to anybody. And I said, okay, first of all, I could choose, if you said I'm supposed to be accountable, accountable to people locally, I could choose the group that I'm accountable to. You see, I could go someplace where nobody's going to condemn my sins. So that really wouldn't be real true accountability then, you know. Secondly, the Bible says I'm accountable to God. I'm going to answer for my own life someday. See? And I am accountable to you people out there too, by the way, my viewers. A lot of you have corrected me in comments, and I change. A lot of you have you know, said things against me and stuff and said, you know, you need to teach this or teach that. I don't agree with you and I'm not going to change. Okay? But it comes right down to it. I'm accountable to God. And if this ministry gets out of line and if this ministry starts to mess around and whatever else, God can shut it down. Just the way it is. But let's keep reading here. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 8. Therefore let us keep the feast not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. I write unto you, I wrote unto you in an epistle not to company with fornicators, yet not, not altogether with the fornicators of this world, or with the covetous or extortioners, or with idolaters, for then must ye needs go out of the world. But now I have written unto you not to keep company if any man that is called a brother be a fornicator or covetous or an idolater or a railer, or a drunkard, or an extortioner, with such an one know not to eat. For what have I to do to judge them uh, also that are without? Do not ye judge them that are within? But them that are without God judgeth. Therefore put away from among yourselves that wicked person. Okay? So, what you're seeing there is that this group, they were judging things uh, according to, hey, this person knows that person. I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. And they, they were doing that, comparing themselves with themselves. They left the standards of the Word of God. And Paul's saying, you know, I don't even need to be here. Okay? And in fact, let's not just stop with this guy. I'm going to give you a whole list of people. Fornicator, a brother, 
you know, it's called a fornicator, covetous, idolater, railer, drunkard, or extortioner. Will such an one know not, not to eat? What does that mean? Somebody's messing around with those sins, you don't eat with them, which would make them, make them what? Isolated. You know, that's a good thing for somebody like that. Say, until you get that sin fixed up, don't come back here and fellowship with us. You go and you get that personal relationship with Jesus Christ worked out. You and Him. Next, let's go to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5, verse 46 and 47. Right? Matthew chapter 5, verse 46. For if ye love them which love you, what reward have ye? Do not even the publicans the same? And if ye salute your brethren only, what do ye more than others? Do not even the publicans so? Again, another description of a lot of these Babel buildings. If you're in the in crowd, boy, you're just you're there and everybody's a good old faithful so-and-so. But boy, you get out of that in crowd. I mean, I've had people that just loved me, at least they claim to, and they're and they're just wonderful and happy and everything else. I leave the bow building, it's just like I don't I never knew him. <laughs> you know. It's like okay, you know. Whatever. You see what's going on? Well their buildings there, their their fellowships are not based upon truth. They're not based in sincerity and truth. They're based in feelings. We're friends. We're in the little clique. And you know, again, the Babel buildings are so extremely clicky. I've never been to one that wasn't. You, there's the in crowd, and then there's the people that don't show up, and they're not as faithful. You know, they're not in the in crowd. Then you have those ones that have that used to go and they used to be faithful, and they've left. And those you have to shun, and gossip about those too. You know, that's important. But uh, let's continue. Third John. Third John. Right back before you're starting to get into the book of Revelation. Third John, then Jude, then Revelation. Third John, chapter 1, verses 9 and 10. I wrote unto the church, but Diotrephes, who loveth to have the preeminence among them, receiveth us not. Wherefore, if I come, I will remember his deeds which he doeth, prating against us with malicious words, and not content therewith. Neither doth he himself receive the brethren, and forbiddeth them that would, and casteth them out of the church. Uh, this guy had kind of an ego trip. He wouldn't let other people come around him. His little group that he had there, it was a special little clique, you know, a special little secret society almost, of people that would come together there to fellowship and to worship. And it was just like, oh, here comes one of the apostles. I'm sorry, no. You can't come into our little group here. See, that's what Jesus Christ was condemning back there in the book of Matthew. He's saying, okay, you have friends that are, you know, in your little group and things. How are you any different than the lost world? The Pharisees and the publicans. How are you any different than them? And, you know, if you have a battle building and you're just like very clicky and just kind of whatever, how are you any different than the lost world? The Masons or the you know, Masonic Lodge or something like that. How are you any different? Hmm. Number four. So again, you know, let me just reiterate this before we go on to the next point. This thing of, well, you can't be in isolation. You have to have somebody that you're accountable to. There are a lot of problems with that. That system can be tweaked and all kinds of other stuff. So I just wanted to say that. Number four. The fourth reason why you should have time of isolation because Jesus gave us an example of isolation to follow. We already read about him in the wilderness there, being tempted of the devil, but now let's go to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6, verses 1 through 8. Okay, it says here, Take heed that ye do not your alms before men to be seen of them, Otherwise ye have no reward of your Father which is in heaven. Therefore, when thou doest thine alms, do not sound a trumpet before thee, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, 
that they may have glory of men, verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But when thou doest thine or when thou doest alms, let not thy right let not thy left hand know what thy right hand doeth, that thine alms may be in secret. And thy father which seeth in secret himself shall reward thee openly. You say, Brian, why are you making such a big thing about the word secret? Um, if it's secret, it would have to be what? Done in isolation. Done in solitude. Hmm. Verse 5. And when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are, for they, sh they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets, that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet, and when thou hast shut thy door, pray to thy Father which is in secret, and thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. But when ye pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. But be not ye therefore like unto them, for your Father knoweth what things ye have need of before ye ask him. You know, it's amazing because a lot of times, you know, with my wife, a lot of times I'll see something that she needs and I just think, well, you know, I don't know, maybe she doesn't want it right now or something like that or whatever. And she'll come along and she'll say, you know, Brian, can I talk to you about something? And she's like, I kind of need something here. And I'm less like, okay, yeah, we can get that, you know. She's, and, you know, a lot of times I'll say, I kind of figured that you needed that. Why didn't you say anything? Well, you know, I wasn't really sure or whatever else. And that's just me and my wife. How about God the Father? Do you think He knows what we need a little bit better than we can know between husband and wife? Very much so. Very much so. The Lord knows what you need. But how are you going to ask Him for those things that you need if you never get alone with Him? Hmm. I mean, spend some time with the Lord. Just you and Him. You know, get alone with Him. You say, well, I, I don't, I'm, I'm kind of afraid to. You're afraid to be alone with your Savior? What is it that you don't want Him to, to uh, convict you about? What is it that you are hiding? You see, if you are afraid to be alone with the Lord... Maybe it's because you're convicted about something. But see, you can find some nice little Bible building somewhere and go compare yourself with other people. Well, he watches movies. She watches TV. Hey, uh, that woman over there, look at her. She's dressed immodestly. I can dress immodestly as a woman. Know what I mean? What's well, okay, you know, okay, so I talk about new vehicles, so I covet a little bit, but everybody else does it at church. Hmm. That never goes on though, I'm sure, right? Sure. Next go to Matthew chapter 26. Matthew 26, verse 31. Then saith Jesus unto them, All ye shall be offended because of me this night, for it is written, I will smite the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock shall be scattered abroad. Did it happen? Yeah. They came for Jesus in the garden, and when they took him, his disciples ran away. And Jesus Christ died alone on that cross. Even though Peter said, I'll go with you to death. No, he didn't. Then he went on to deny Jesus Christ three times. Hmm. Turn next to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. You say, well, Brian, that was Jesus. And that, that sure would have been hard, wouldn't it? Yeah, it sure would have. But uh, there's a sense in which you're going to have to go through that too. If you're really truly saved. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1. What does Paul say here? He says, Be followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. Paul is following Christ's example, and you're told to follow Paul, which means you will be following Christ. <laughs> you want to be Christ-like? 
You say, oh, that'd be so neat to be Christ-like, to be called to say that I'm Christ-like. That'd be so wonderful to be Christ-like. Okay, are you ready to be alone? Hmm. Second Timothy chapter 4. Second Timothy chapter 4. Verse 16 through 18. It says here, at my first answer, no man stood with me, but all men forsook me. I pray God that it may not be laid to their charge, notwithstanding. This is the good part. The Lord stood with me and strengthened me, that by me the preaching might be fully known, and that all the Gentiles might hear, and I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion. And the Lord shall deliver me from every evil work, and will preserve me unto his heavenly kingdom, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Hmm. Paul was following in the footsteps of Jesus. All men forsook Jesus Christ. All men forsook Paul. Dear Christian, have all men forsook you? Has your family forsaken you? Have your former friends forsaken you? People that you once knew and trusted, have they forsaken you? Well, the Bible says right there, you're following in Paul's footsteps and following in Christ's footsteps. And you know what? Sometimes it's lonely. Sometimes it's very difficult to go through this. I mean, I've, I've had a very difficult time with, with I mean, I'm, I'm somewhat of a friendly guy and things and a family turn against me and stuff like that. And it, it's just like, I don't understand. I don't understand this. I, I why? I, I don't. I don't get it. Right there. Notwithstanding, the Lord stood with me. I don't know why. Sometimes I think I'm just a, a low down, good for nothing. I don't know why the Lord even bothered to save me. Some of the sins I did in my past and things, and you know, forgetting those things which are behind. I know that. But the fact of the matter is, the Lord stands with me, even when other people don't. Are you ready to go through the same thing? Number five, the final point. Why is isolation a good thing for a Christian? Well, if you want to turn to Romans chapter 14 a while, Romans chapter 14, verse 10. The fact of the matter is, Christian, in the end, you alone are going to have to give an account for the life that you lived. Nobody's going to be able to stand with you. Let me show you the verses. Romans chapter 14, verse 10. But why dost thou judge thy brother? Or why dost thou set it not thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For it is written, As I live, saith the Lord, Every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So then every one of us shall give account of himself. To God. Are you ready to give account of yourself? Are you ready after the rapture to have the Lord look through your belongings? Are you ready tonight or today, whatever time it is? Are you ready to have the Lord look into your life, look into your thoughts? Are you ready for that? You say, oh, well, I'm sorry, Brian, I didn't hear you. I'm, I'm, I'm with all my friends, I'm with all my people, and, and we're having a good time here. I'll, I'll get back to you some other time. Why don't you shut the uh, television off? You shouldn't have it in your home anyhow. Why don't you shut some of the other stuff off? Why don't you say, you know what, I'm just going to take some time off from going to be with my Christian brothers and sisters and things. I just want to spend some time with the Lord. I want to spend some time with isolation, solitude, just myself and the Lord. And just get down on my knees and just say, Lord, what do you want me to give up? What do you want me to do with my life? And let the Lord come in and do some house cleaning. I've done a tremendous amount of that in the last couple of years. And I don't know if I'm done yet. <laughs> uh, I certainly have gotten rid of a lot of things. I've actually laid down a whole lot else. I'd, I feel convicted about having in my home. It's mostly just research materials and whatever else, you know. But am I open to the Lord telling me to get rid of something? Yeah. 
because you see it's worth it. You know, I had to give up some things when I got married. Mm -hmm. Sure. I'm not a single guy. I can't just go out and do whatever I want anymore. But it was worth it. The loving relationship between a husband and wife is worth you giving things up. Hey, the loving relationship between you and the Lord is worth you giving up whatever you have to give up. Get alone with the Lord and let Him tell you what to give up. 1 Corinthians chapter 4. Turn over there. 1 Corinthians chapter 4. You say, well, what if I do this, Brian? What if I, what if I get alone with the Lord for a while? And, and I know many of you already have done that. Many of you have already expressed to me in comments and things and emails and whatever else that, that you're basically <laughs> away from anybody and everybody's forsaken you and, and whatever else. And you say, you know, people just can't relate to me. Well, brother, sister, I can tell you that you're right where you need to be with the Lord. Let me show you. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 10. We are fools for Christ's sake. Have you ever been called a fool? But ye are wise in Christ. Speaking to this, these carnal people, these carnal professing Christians in the Corinthian church there. We are weak, but ye are strong. Ye are honorable, but we are despised. Isn't it amazing how a lot of these people that go to the big Babel buildings and everything else, and they're in the in crowd, you know, they're honorable, but people like us are despised. You're one of those church jumpers. You can't be happy anywhere. You're just divisive. You're a problem. You're a troublemaker. You're this, you're that. We're despised. Verse 11. Even unto this present hour we both hunger and thirst and are naked, naked and buffeted and have no certain dwelling place and labor working with our own hands. Being reviled, we bless. Being persecuted, we suffer it. Being defamed, we entreat. We are made as the filth of the world and are the offscouring of all things unto this day. I write not these things to shame you, but as my beloved sons, I warn you. Paul is saying to these Corinthian believers, he's saying, if you want to live a, the kind of life that you should be, if you want to live and be like us, the apostles, this is what to expect. And it is. Finally, let's go to 2 Timothy chapter 4. Keep there earlier, but we're going to read a couple of the other verses. 2 Timothy chapter 4. Second Timothy chapter four verse six through eleven. For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight, I have finished my course, I have kept the faith. Can you say that? You know, for years and years and years I couldn't. I could not honestly say that I was ready to go see the Lord. I could not honestly say that I had a personal relationship. I was saved, yeah, you know, in that sense I had a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. I was a Christian, I was a new creature in Christ Jesus, but my personal relationship wasn't very good. I really didn't talk to the Lord very much. I didn't have much fellowship with the Lord. I really didn't understand His Word that much. And it took a long time, it took me years, you know, to get to the point where, you know, and, and it's not, I, I haven't arrived yet either, by the way, I haven't, I'm not having a perfect relationship with Jesus Christ. There are times... I don't do very good being with the Lord. But I thank the Lord for those times when I can get away and I can just me myself in the Lord. Myself in Him. Verse 8. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love His appearing. Do thy diligence to come shortly unto me. For Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world, and is departed unto Thessalonica, Crescens to Galatia, Titus unto Dalmatia. Only Luke is with me. Take Mark and bring him with thee, for he is profitable to me for the ministry. If you're not there, 
Christian, if you are not able to say, all men forsook me, only brother so-and-so is with me, only sister so-and-so is with me, only my friends here on YouTube are with me. If you're not there yet, you'll get there. You'll get to the point where you realize this. The more truth, the more you stand for this book, the more you stand for the Word of God and preach the Word of God and witness to your lost relatives and, and even the carnal Christians and things, the more you do that, the more you will be isolated. You know, one of the most convicting things I've ever heard of was a story, and I've told this in other studies, so bear with me, but if you're familiar with the other studies, if you're not, you can watch them. But uh, one of the most convicting things I ever heard was a story of a man that was in a prisoner of war camp in Vietnam, the Vietnam War. And this guy went, went through just horrible things. I mean, they, they were eating uh, pig meat that had maggots crawling on it and things. They were uh, putting them down into vats of raw sewage and, and just sitting them out there in these little bamboo cages in the, in the hot blazing sun. You know, they're, they're all crunched up, their legs up, you know, up, you know at their shoulders and things and, and, and crunched into these little bamboo cages out there in the hot sun over 100 degrees, you know. And, and a lot of the guys were going crazy. And the one man he didn't go crazy. He lived to tell about it. He said, what was his secret? What was his secret of success? Well, he must have been a really good survivalist. Uh, well, actually, he knew the Bible. He was a saved man, and he was quoting scripture to himself and singing hymns to himself. And that kept him sane. And you know, the conviction comes because I say to myself many times, do I know enough scripture? Do I know enough of the old hymns? to keep myself sane like that? Could I survive in a isolated situation like that? And I'll tell you what, that inspired me. Inspired me to really study the book, really study the Word of God, really listen to the right kind of music. You know, I, you say, well then you have all Christian music. I have some secular music, some of the old stuff, some old uh, symphony orchestra type of stuff and some old bluegrass music. It sings about country living and and whatever else. I stay away from the you know my wife cheated with that wife and you know, or this whatever else, all the junk. You know I stay away from that stuff. But the point is, could I get more sanctified with my walk with the Lord? Yeah, I could. You know, and I'm open to the Lord correcting me and telling me, okay, this needs to go, that needs to go, whatever. But I can only know when He's speaking to me when I'm willing to listen and when I get away with the Lord. Um, should you practice isolation as a Christian? Well, that would be a definite yes. You need to develop that personal relationship with Jesus Christ. That way, no matter what happens, you aren't going to care. You aren't going to say, well, you know, the persecution has come to Christian churches here in America. What am I going to do? I guess I'm just going to have to go with the world. You see, if you have a real true relationship with the Lord that has been developed through solitude, through isolation, you can always go back to that. You can always fall back to that and they say, the government's going to come down and, and shut down the church locally here. You know, I'm going with their terminology here. You know, and you say, oh well, you know, I'll just go back to myself and the Lord. See? Yes, you do need to have some experience with isolation. Even in your prayers. You know, like we read there in the book of Matthew, chapter 6. Get away with the Lord sometime. Right? And if people are putting you down and you're feeling kind of lonely and things like that, you're going through some of those struggles, be encouraged. Okay, You are following in the footsteps of Paul who followed in the footsteps of the Lord Jesus Christ. You're doing right. A right relationship with the Lord is going to lead to solitude, to isolation. And sometimes you might only meet a Christian or two every once in a while and just be there to exhort them and, and, and testify to what the Lord's doing in your life. But stay strong. Okay, let's close with a word of prayer.
Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you so much for your word. And I know this message was a real challenge to me because a lot of times I just don't spend much time with you, Lord. I, it's kind of like you say there in the book of Revelation about the one church that they left their first love. I know, Lord, sometimes the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches spring up and choke the word and, and I get to be a little bit unfruitful. And there are many times when I have opportunities to witness and I don't take those opportunities. And uh, Lord, I just pray that you would help me to be a better Christian. And I help. I pray that you'd help all those out there that are listening to this, that they too would be convicted and get away with you and just develop that personal relationship. And just spend some time, Lord, just them and you. And uh, I just pray, Lord, for your discernment for all the brothers and sisters out there that watch this channel. I thank you for all of them, Lord. And I thank you for the fact that they convict me many times in their comments and encourage me as well. And I just um, pray that you would give each of us opportunities to serve you and, and that you would speak to each of us and help us to have uh, open hearts and open minds to what you want us to, to do with our lives. And I pray it all in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. So, it's kind of interesting. I was actually preparing another sermon, not this one, and uh, got an email from a sister over in Australia. And I won't say the name or anything. I never do that. I protect people's you know, privacy on that. But um, just talked about how that going from Baptist church to Baptist church and, and then finally just saying, you know what? House church. There's no local church in the area. Yeah, there's nothing there. And, and the Bible doesn't even talk about that stuff. So we're just going to serve the Lord. We're just going to worship the Lord and how the, the blessing that comes from that. And I can assure you that there will be times that you will go through that you will be lonely. Uh, times when you will just feel like, are we the only ones that are saved here? I mean, like, <laughs> you know, if the rapture happened, are we, like, going to be the only ones that go, you know? You're going to feel that way at some times. You know, as a, as a Bible-believing Christian, we are the greatest minority on the earth, you know. Um, you know, like the old children's song, you know, red and yellow, black and white. Instead of they are precious in his sight, it'd be they are very few in his sight, you know. There's not much of us. There are very few. Um, you're not going to have a whole lot of fellowship down here. And that's kind of the point. You see, our time of fellowship is going to be eternity. And I know this sister said about, you know, really thankful for the ministry here and everything. And, and I've had a lot of brothers and sisters write me and they say, I just, I'd love to be able to meet you someday. And, and just thank you for what you've meant in my life. And that, that's a great encouragement to me. I always appreciate hearing that. And I, I would love to meet a lot of you out there as well. Um, some of you, no, not so much so. But uh, I'm just messing around. But, uh, you know, when we get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. I mean, it is going to be amazing. That's when the fellowship is going to be right. We're going to be in heaven. We're going to be glorified saints. We're not going to have bad fellowship up there. We're not going to be talking about worldly things. So, you know, even if you have a, a good group that you're part of and, and really uh, meeting together with a lot of people and things like that, I, I'm not against that. You know, I, I'm, I'm trying to encourage brethren. That, that's, a, that's a good thing to meet with other Christians. But uh, don't make it to the point where you don't ever have any time alone with the Lord. There's some times that you need to just get alone with the Lord. I remember reading the one time about uh, Oliver Cromwell, the uh, Lord Protector over there in England, right after King Charles I, King James, King Charles, then the parliamentary forces rose up. There was a civil war over there in uh, England, and Cromwell was put in, you know, and, and everything. And uh, he was a Calvinist, so a Puritan, but um, he had some issues, but. I, I do respect the man for a, a lot of what he did and a lot of what he stood for. But they said that many times before he would make a decision, he would disappear and just be out in the wilderness for a couple days, just out there by himself. You know, we've, we miss a lot of that stuff now. We don't really do much of that. We're so busy. 
you know, we get on YouTube and we, we just look at videos after videos after videos. And I, you know, I've been guilty of that myself. You know, there are times I'll be up till really late at night, you know, watching videos and reading comments and trying to reply to people and all the stuff like that. I get caught up in that, you know. And how much time do I really put aside for the Lord? That's, that's what really convicted me doing this study. I just thought to myself, boy, you know, a lot of times I'm just not spending time with the Lord like I used to. You know, and something we all need to get back to. Just wanted to challenge you with that today. So I pray that you take it to heart and uh, get along with the Lord this week. So that's it. Thank you for watching.